This week is very much a, a point in the course when we stop and do a bit of thinking. The articles that you were asked to read give you a, an overview of the early accounting undertaken before the periods we've been looking at. And in the middle of that, there's audit. And from there you go to look at auditing in the first professional body of auditors that we would recognise using the way that we define professions today. And then you um, have a, a look at the accounting profession as we know it and its history and there they basically set in this, this scene and topping and tailing what you've had so far so that you can see what type of accounting was done 5,000 years ago and fit it on to the, the types of bookkeeping and accounting that you've been reading about for several weeks. Get some insight into things other than bookkeeping and accounting that were done that relate to accounting, i.e. auditing. And in the process, begin to learn about the creation of a profession of accountants. Initially, based on audit, but in the 19th century, based on the ability to basically prepare financial statements and maintain account books using double entry bookkeeping. The first of the articles that you were to read was by Willard Stone published over 50 years ago and that's something that needs to be taken into account when reading what it has to say because as you know history always has to be revisited we never know for sure about anything from the past and this article was written at a time when what it reports was perceived wisdom It talks about the heritage of accounting and auditing and talks about primitive tribes doing their own forms of auditing and accounting, particularly the, that some use knotted sticks, um, the Peruvian Indians kept all sorts of records using string, knots and loops and colour. And then the Chinese using knotted cords again. So string was used as a form of accounting. Talks about um, symbols from 5000 BC. That's 7000 years ago. And then moves through all sorts of things that have been discovered by archaeologists. Um, in caves, in tombs places like Egypt and Spain and it makes the point that it's interesting that the earliest records that we would perceive as keeping an account were for practical things to do with administration of government and that the earliest writing that we know was exclusively about accounts. Now where that all starts usually in the literature that, that um, is currently consulted is in Mesopotamia, ancient Babylonia and Egypt. And Mesopotamia, he talks about Sumerians, it's all around about uh, Iraq really, in the modern map. Talks about the use of uh, 
stones to record commercial transactions in 3600 BC and clay tablets being used in 3200 BC that's five and a half thousand years ago almost and there was subsequent research done that isn't mentioned in this paper which succeeded in translating what the clay tablets are actually saying and it was a system of keeping a record of what had been done, typically contracts of one type or another, with duplicate copies, one done first and then placed in, in, on clay, then placed inside an envelope made of clay, which was then sealed and in the process the, um, it took a copy of what was on the tablet that was inside it. So you could verify the accuracy of the record by opening the envelope. It was quite sophisticated and it involved some, some forms of internal control. And we see examples, as he points out, that little notches beside um, or marks that indicate that there's been, been some checking going on. And that's the sort of thing that you'll see if you ever come across a, a set of account books rather than on computer where auditors will tick the entries to indicate they've checked them. Because on to Egypt, Egypt, internal control and audit were in use there. And it and makes the point that it wasn't just something that you learnt on the job. They actually set up schools both in Mesopotamia, the temple schools, and in Egypt, they had treasury schools. And the people that did this, the scribes that did the accounting and the auditing, had a, a very high status. They could, they could read, and they could write, and very few people could read or write. And that gave them a power that other people recognised. So including in the article, it mentions some statues, uh, or a statue for a scribe. It mentions a person acting as a, an accountant, or a scribe uh, for a queen being promoted to the emperor when the queen was deposed. It says that the, the high status in Egypt for scribes lasted 800 years, so it was a very high profile, a very high status profession. To an extent, much more so than accountants are now anywhere in the world, albeit they are recognised with high status in most places, but this was the exceptionally high status they had. So basically the, the governments were able to function efficiently because of what the scribes were doing, because of the the management of the financial side of the uh, of government by the scribes on behalf of the government goes on to Persian civilizations from 549 to 330 BC gives some examples that are fairly well known just generally by people with an interest in in ancient history drops in names that most people who have that interest would have heard of The general sense that you get as you're reading through this, I expect, or did get, was that, you know, taxes had to be administered, had to be checked, had to be collected, and the people collecting them had to be, had to be uh, validated. You had to make sure they were actually doing it. You get instances described in this paper of division of responsibility across various people in the process, to, which would have obviously reduce fraud. He goes on to then talk about the Cretan and the Hebrew civilizations, um, going from about 3000 up to more recent times. And he talks about how, they, again, the scribes were heavily involved. They, they ran the, the uh, administration did that in, the, in the Cretan civilization, did that in the Hebrew civilization talks about various people that whose names are well known 
Um, like King David of Israel, Jonathan, Solomon. And he uses the Bible to, to get some of the material that he includes about this because the Bible does describe to some extent what, what was done administratively by the society at that time. He moves on to the ancient Greece, which is typically where the accounting historians stop. They don't go back much further. A few have gone back to Mesopotamia, but the gap in between is hardly ever touched. But take ancient Greek, ancient Greece. Accounting and auditing became important. The, he mentions or describes the process by why each citizen became an auditor. Because contractors of public buildings were required to record on the walls of the building the receipts and expenditures. And he gives examples of that being done elsewhere as well. In, in Egypt. It goes to some extent, some detail about um, Greece, Athens, the whole page, more than elsewhere. He, he mentions the, the existence in Athens of ten state accountants whose duties were to audit the collection of taxes and other revenues, to apportion the revenue among the various temple treasuries to control their expenditure and to annually take a complete inventory of the temple's contents and property, which is effectively what we'd expect accountants to do nowadays if, that, if they were involved in, in that type of activity for government. Then goes to the Roman Empire, so he's moving towards the present day more. Uh, remember, the, the Roman Empire ceased in the four. 160s. He talks about how the, the, the emperor, the empire, the emperor used quaestors who came into existence around about 200 BC and they were financial officers responsible to Rome, custody of the treasury, supervised the scribes in their duty of recording treasury receipts and disbursements and examined the accounts of governors of subjugated countries. Now, those of you that have read this, that should have resonated to you with the Venetian Procuratory because it's exactly the same role. So this was that role being undertaken in Rome, 200 BC, the Procuratory were doing it a uh, thousand plus years later in Venice. He talks about Cicero. Now, Cicero's mentioned once or twice in the accounting history um, relating to the Roman Empire, but this is only one instance of it, and it's a rather abbreviated version, but nevertheless it makes the point that Cicero um, criticised the report, financial reporting done by uh, urban questors to the Senate. The Roman Empire made use of a complete system of checks and counterchecks by separating tasks and roles. Then moves into the Byzantine world, Constantinople. That's around modern Turkey, roughly. How there was a school founded in Constantinople in 800 AD, which taught accounting and other subjects for training government officials. At this point, you have to be careful because we don't have that amount of evidence to be able to say that. This is what people thought, and his source for that was a book that was published in 1921. Now books are not as reliable as refereed journal articles because no one checks a book. You can write anything you want in a book and publish it. It's misleading to assume that books are reliable sources. They're opinion pieces from start to finish. No matter how much in the way of citations are included they're one person's opinion. But he's, so he's taken what was in the book and he's made a statement of, of fact, which may well be a statement of fact in the book. But currently, you wouldn't find anyone writing that because we have no proof that accounting was actually taught. 
in the school. He then moves on to uh, the Middle Ages. And here's where you might begin to see some things that look a bit strange. But he starts off by talking about Charlemagne. And it was around that period uh, that, that he's referring to. Charlemagne died in 25. He was the Holy Roman Emperor. It was at that time that we had the existence of the LSD monetary system, the 2012 monetary system, pensions and pens, Euro Solidinari, that permeated right across Europe, which is frequently encountered in uh, account books right through to, to the 20th century. It makes the interesting claim that in the Middle Ages accounting suffered a decline because of general disorganised condition of government and economy throughout Europe. Now think about Arnold's book. What Stone is doing is he's, he's basically just saying what people thought of the medieval period, that it was backward, that everything was in decay and that things no longer functioned in the way they had efficiently under the Romans. And Arnold says, well, that's not actually true. And medieval historians would now would say that's not actually true. So this is the view as it was in 1969. The complicated operations of the bankers, the papacy, and the monarchies required a careful system of bookkeeping. That is true. The accounting methods of imperial Rome, which were lost in the 7th century to Western Europe, now, why the seventh? Why not the sixth? Why not, you know, because the Roman Emperor is finished in the, in the fifth. But he's saying that it continued in Constantinople. They were adopted by the Arabs, because it's just to the east and south of Constantinople is the region, and were revived in Italy during the Crusades, because uh, the Crusades went into that region. They took merchants, went, went along or stayed behind after they left. And that's where the Venetians, the Genoese, obtained the scarce and exotic goods from Asia, or from the Middle East, the spices, which completely changed trade, international trade in Europe. And he's saying, he's basically saying that because the Romans' practices continued in Constantinople, they were passed on to the Arabs and they subsequently were picked up by the Italians. Now you can take that at face value, but there's no evidence to support that. Absolutely none. And it's, it's like the same thing that people assume that because Italian merchants and merchant bankers were trading in Northern Europe in the Middle Ages and because the Italian merchants and merchant bankers were using double entry that therefore all of Europe should have learned double entry. There is no guarantee that techniques will be picked up by close contact. It's only picked up when the person who's using a technique chooses to show you it and there's no evidence that this actually happened. He talks about the fully developed system of double entry in Genoa because in 1969 that was believed, in 1340, was believed to be the first example of a complete adoption of double entry. Subsequently, we know it's not. And he talks about auditing regaining its importance as a governmental tool. If, our, if auditing ever lost its importance, I'd be astonished, and so would most people. But they just, it's consistent with what people believed in 1969. He talks about England, the use of the pipe roll. There's a lot of literature on that. And then he mentions the use of tally sticks, which were in widespread use across Europe, way in... Way, all over Europe, European mainland, beyond into Russia. And they were used extensively in England until relatively recently. He says that government auditing was carried on, so 
here we're talking about still medieval period. He says that Leonardo Fibonacci, uh, the author of several books on mathematics, was employed to audit the accountants of the city of Pisa. Well, Fibonacci is accredited with founding Abaco Mathematics in Italy, which is the mathematics that was learnt by as the children of merchants in the Abaco school system in northern Italy from around about 1260 up to the end of the 16th century. A very important person. And he says that he was he was employed to audit the accounts of the city. Well, there's no evidence about that. Uh, he was employed as a, a surveyor by the city and reading between the lines of the appointment or of what was written about it at the time, it, he may well have been teaching people of Abaco. Uh, whether he was doing an audit is another matter altogether. The city of Dublin was audited in 1316 and Columbus's voyage to the, to the Americas in 1492 was accompanied by an auditor. It's usually said that he was accompanied by an accountant or a bookkeeper, to be honest, um, rather than an auditor. And the person who accompanied, accompanied Columbus actually kept the books. Then he goes on to auditing in the private sector. It goes way back in time, comes forward again, and he says it's not until the 15th century that we have evidence of systematic auditing of business firms. Regular audits of the records of the Medici Bank were performed during the period 1397 to 1494. That's a banking firm, not a business firm. The main office in Florence required an annual balance sheet be submitted by each branch. Well, it wasn't. It was a balance account. It was just a list of balances. The same as was used to, by Dettini in Prato for all his branches in the mid-14th century and late 14th century, early 15th. And he says that for the, the Medici, the general manager and his assistants audited the statements which were still found in the archives of Florence, these balance accounts, as had uh, Francesco di Marco Dattini. The Medici were very, very careful and they had the most advanced uh, bookkeeping system that we know of in double entry bookkeeping in the 15th century. And he then, he then um, puts in a long quotation from De Rover in which he describes what was done with the balance account. Now this is quite informative, it's very informative. Because balance accounts prepared by branches were rare, but they did exist. Um, earlier, particularly in, in the did case of Dettini, but I've never seen anyone write about what they were actually for, except De Rover, and he talks about it. And basically, they, they used it to check um, the likelihood of having to repay deposits to the bank, and the prospects of obtaining any payment for overdrafts or debts owed to the bank. And of the annotations that were made on the side, and he concludes that at least 22 items appearing as assets for a total of 575 florins, which is a lot of money, uh, represent overdue accounts which should have been written off. Now that's uh, interesting in that it's, he's managed to identify ones he thinks are too big because of the comments put beside him. That they should have been written off because that's what we would do today. So De Rover is being whiggish. And the lack of an explanation for why they weren't written off is, is interesting and it's something that it's not yet being addressed. But it's all to do with the, the need to show you you've got resources uh, to be able to transfer funds the ability to make 
debtors pay whoever you want them to pay that was backed up by statutes. There are good reasons for keeping debts on the books. And uh, he runs from there to how one of the Medici branches, a branch in London, had a lot of problems because, among other things, of a loan made to the King of England, of the way that that was repayment was dealt with, which did not involve repayment of money. And then he switches into the 16th century, audits of both government and industrial ventures. He talks about 1631 and how the people that were funding the, the Plymouth Fathers who went off to settle in the United States sent an auditor from Holland because loans had been made 11 years earlier and, and rather than being repaid, they were increasing. He doesn't mention the auditors that you read about in the second article this week, the Venetian articles. But as a summary of accounting, bookkeeping, the techniques that were used, like uh, separation of duties, internal controls, that largely predates the material we've been looking at from 1200 to 1800. Gives you a more rounded picture of what accountants have always done. Very long recognised profession. It's one that's always been around and it's always been required by rulers and by anyone who's running businesses of any type. So the accountants have always been important and we know what they were doing way back in time. So this is just summary. It's a pretty good one. There's some things that now that, that as I've referred to we now know differently but nevertheless the sorts of things he's describing are perfectly valid and gives you a good overview of what accountants did before you came to the development of modern accounting which began in the 12th century when double entry started to be used. The second article that you had to read this week was um, on the Collegio di Rosonati in Venice, created in 1581 the first professional body of auditors. Now, it's an interesting paper on several dimensions, not least that for the things it doesn't say. Now, one thing it starts, says very, very near the beginning, and you can see the beginning of the quotation at the foot of the first page on this screen. The full quotation. Basically, until 1558, or in 1558, bookkeepers in Venice were just bookkeepers. They had, they were, they were experts at their craft, or were meant to be. But you just became a bookkeeper. You didn't get a certificate, a diploma, or any formal recognition for being one. It wasn't like in the ancient world when scribes were revered and given high status, bookkeepers were not. The man who wrote this, Alvis Casanova, published a manual on double entry bookkeeping in 1558 in which he wrote this. Now he himself was a was a Rasanati bookkeeper and he believed that the bookkeepers needed to have the necessary um, validation before they should be able to do what they're doing. And he says other things too, but um, basically he's saying that the bookkeepers that are around just now, many of them are not worth paying to do what they do because they don't know how to do it. And it's about time bookkeepers were recognised formally in the same way that notaries are. And yet, what a bookkeeper writes is accepted without any further evidence by the law. Now that's an exaggeration, but it's it's getting the point across. 
And sort of upside down, because nowadays when you look at accounting history, talking about notaries, they, they, it's assumed that because notaries were notaries, what they wrote was accepted without any, any evidential support. Which perhaps raises a question as to why we think that what notaries wrote, and they did a lot of contracts, um, and in some parts of Italy they kept account books. Why is it that notaries are believed by accounting historians to give legal validity to anything that they write when someone from that period is saying, well, actually, they didn't. So anyway, returning to the article. When the changes were proposed, or changes, there were changes to the appointments, because up until the, the formation of the Collegio de Rassonati in Venice, original citizens got the posts. It was like uh, an old boys network. They were uh, close to other people. But when the Collegio was formed, the idea was it would be opened up and that you'd pass an exam and that would allow you into it. And once you were in it, you could get a job in working for the city, state. The paper discusses a report prepared by what it, what it describes as a prestigious accountant, Bartolomeo Tadini, and it's it's a it's a it's a pretty um, comprehensive report, and it's not favourable on all counts. It's it's critical. This man, Bartolomeo Tadini, prepared it, described in the article as a prestigious accountant working in the public administration. And in the article, it's, it's, there's, it's asserted that he was not actually an original citizen, and that implies that he wasn't a very high status. However, in a footnote at the end of the article, an end note, he's found to have been, or de declared to have been, the chief accountant of the Venetian arsenal. In other words, he was an extremely important accountant in Venice at that point in time. And if you look at the register of the people who entered the Collegio di, di Rasonati, which is presented in the paper, uh, connecting the names to the families of the, the effect of the upper class of Venice, you'll find at the very top there on the left, the first name is Tadini. So he, he was the first person to be registered as a member of the He was approved. He passed the exam. Then it goes, it goes into some detail about what happened, about the various um, levels of society and how they interacted and how they impacted this, this whole process. And in the end, the aspirations to make it open and all the rest of it were not retained. At one point was the examination itself. The paper includes examples of <coughs> questions from Abaco and from bookkeeping manuals from around the same period. And it's got examples, it has the examples of the two surviving exam questions for the Collegio. If you look at the Abaco questions, the emphasis is on doing quite complicated mathematics. Abaco was applied mathematics. It did not include any bookkeeping. And you look at the bookkeeping example it gives. This gives you a much simpler mathematics. And you have to make the entries from it. So it's very much focusing on the bookkeeping with the mathematics secondary. Then you look at the Collegio de Rassonati exam questions, and you see the first one, it looks simple, but it's not quite as simple as it looks because of the 10 year period. And you have to show the entry in the, of the account balance. Second one, it's much more complicated mathematics. 
and you have to show the bookkeeping entries. So you have a situation here where you had two distinct branches of knowledge, the abaco, which was the maths, and the bookkeeping, and they did not get taught in the same place. Now, in the College de la exam, the emphasis appears to be more on the mathematics, and is more on the mathematics, but you're still required to be able to do the bookkeeping. And it just shows the coming together of the two. The exam is from the first part of the 18th century. Whether it was done this way in the 16th century is open to debate, and you could speculate that in actual fact, in the 16th century, there was more emphasis on the mathematics. Because remember what Luca Pacioli said, that the important thing for a true merchant was being able to do the mathematics. And if you couldn't do the mathematics, you couldn't do anything. But if you could do the mathematics and you were not very good at bookkeeping, the mathematics would get you out of a mess because it would, you'd be able to correct your mistakes. So it's unlikely that the Collegio de Rassonati would have been looking for people to come in already equipped as both bookkeepers and good at mathematics. It's much more likely they wanted the mathematics because that's what was taught in the Abaco system and that the bookkeeping would largely have been learnt in situ when the Collegio was founded in 1581. However, we've got no evidence, so possibly it was questions exactly like this that were done in the first set of exams undertaken in 1590. We don't know. But the Rasinati came in and they were handed, they were, they were uh, approved, the new ones, and they were assigned roles in the state, and some would have been bookkeeping, some would have been auditors, and so on. If you look at the procuratorian, and what they were doing with the um, with the charities, they were auditing. And to audit, you need to be good at the maths, and you picked the bookkeeping up as you went along. So the emphasis in the 15th century and in the 16th century was arguably much more on mathematics. So the auditors that were appointed to the Collegio de Resonati primarily had to be good at maths, just like a merchant. And secondly, if possible, good at bookkeeping. And it's quite possible that the, the, the emphasis in the, of the bookkeeping in these two questions was added later as it became apparent that um, they needed to be expert at, more expert at that uh, to balance up their ability at maths, but we don't know. The third article you were to look at this week was by Tom Lee, in which he picks up what was contained in a monograph by Brian West, a prize-winning monograph on the, on the state of the accounting profession and on why it is a profession. I looked to see if the very depressing conclusion drawn by West that the accounting profession didn't really have an identifiable future role or place and see what he concluded on that. Basically underpinning the whole thing is that accountants, professional accountants, have very tenuous knowledge that no one else has. And if everyone else can do what accountants can do, they have no future. And in a digital age with artificial intelligence, which is not mentioned at all in the article, which was written a few years ago before this would have become relevant, for a profession to continue to exist, it needs to have something that sets it aside it needs its unique selling point. In the paper he suggests that there should be research undertaken in order to identify what knowledge accountants should have that would set them apart. And they should do things to 
ring fence that knowledge rather than making it available to everyone. Attention is drawn to the convergence project undertaken by the FASB and the IASB where they tried to bring the two sets of accounting standards together and the delays and the prevarication and the non-progress that resulted. And by not managing to get consensus to demonstrate accounting wasn't a unified profession in one part of the world, it was a different type of activity to what it is in another or the nature of it was different and they couldn't be reconciled. And that itself is a problem. He said that double entry posed a lot of problems. And double entry is really the only skill that accountants have that other professions don't have. However, there are instructions everywhere that you look on how to do double entry, and anyone who really wants to learn it can do so. Whereas, and he makes the point in the paper, medical professionals have to go through a very controlled process to get recognition as doctors. And the knowledge they have and the expertise they have isn't freely available. So there's quite a contrast between that profession and the accounting profession. And what he says in the fourth paragraph there, if accountants are to hold the, the demise of their professional occupation, they need to commit unambiguously to identifying and controlling an authoritative body of accounting knowledge. But they haven't done so yet. They're complacent. They are content with what they have, and that what they have are a set of arbitrary rules without any cognitive foundation. They are derived from contributions of non-accountants with no overall responsibility for accountancy. In other words, the accounting profession allows itself to be led by others who are not accounting professionals. Now, this was published in a history journal, so not surprisingly, he then adopts a historical approach. Quotes from Hobsbawm, who's a well-known historian, argues that the purpose of history is to provide knowledge about patterns and mechanisms inherent in past societal changes of which contemporary plans and actions can be contemplated. Now that is saying that the purpose for doing history is to provide lessons for the present. That's one perspective you can adopt on history. And maybe you can learn from mistakes in the past, which I think is more the essence of what is going to is done in this paper. So the paper argues the current state of accounting and the accounting procession is a consequence of historical origins. And in order to identify what these are, you need to step back. And he says that uh, the second dis dimension of what he's is dealing with is periodization, where history is bound with a defined time period. So you have to define the time period and you have to um, look at the historical origins of today's accounting. And he says that t today's accounting, modern accounting, starts with double entry. As it was formally originated, defined in the 15th century by Luca Pacioli and ends with the, what's going on at the moment with the regulations, the accounting standards. And he says that this period containing contains significant accounting innovation, talks about costs and so on, and is sufficiently long to permit proper assessment of the influential patterns and mechanisms resulting from accounting's origins. In other words, you can see over this period, which is in excess of 500 years, what has happened to accounting to get to the point we're at now? It says the double entry is perceived as the means to organise and make visible to order managers the volume and detail of business transaction in a precise and controlled manner. That's how it was perceived. It was the start of a process by which the body of accounting knowledge belonged to everyone. When Pacioli presented his titis, he told the world how to do it. So Everyone had this knowledge. So the accounting profession couldn't really say, well, we know things other people don't know. They've never played that card. They've never claimed that. 
You claim they have the ability more than the knowledge. Then he goes, starts to go through a whole series of things related to double entry. Now, you've all studied this course for eight weeks. You've read several things about what's in the literature. Uh, you've read several items of literature and you've heard me talking about them. And a great deal of what follows in these pages is the result of the state that the history has got itself into, the literature has got itself into, based on what happened when people were researching medieval accounting history. So you can take the, that statement there and you can delete great big portions of it because they're just not right. For example, according to Pacioli, the use of double entry ensured mercantile activity was as pleasing to God as art or music. No. Double entry represent a belief in commercial order sanctified by God. No. Nowhere was that the case. Another example follows. Another enduring characteristic of double entry is its non-compliance with additivity. And again, you can delete all that because Pacioli never gave instructions on balance sheets and combining um, assets into a category rather than as individual assets. And this statement that double entry is dependent on prescribed rules for recording business transactions, well, that all depends. The way that Patchouli presented it was the Venetian way. The way he presented it was different from the way it was done in Florence. So these weren't rules on how to do double entry. These were simply uh, rules on how to organise things. And if it had been written for Florence, there would have been different rules on how to organise things. That's nothing to do with the content. And Patchouli didn't give rules on how to do debits and credits. He did what the International Accounting Standards Board does, or reports to do, and that is he presented the principles that defined the method. And they're very different from a set of rules. Rules are inflexible, principles are the opposite, they're flexible. In the paper he talks about the emergence of public accountants, doesn't um, refer to the Venetians, Collegio uh, Rassonati. He jumped straight into Britain and the paper has a very strong British focus. He says they started, the accountants have started to appear in the middle of the 19th century but they were really acting as lawyers would act and they had a, a specialisation that was very much one that was tied to the law rather than to business. And uh, he says that accountants sometimes acted as lawyers and lawyers sometimes acted as accountants. It goes on to talk about how the, these were, these uh, associations were city-based and they spread to regional and international, effectively. So in Edinburgh you had the Chartered Accountants Edinburgh, Glasgow, and Aberdeen, those weren't their names, but they eventually joined together to create the Institute Chartered Accounts of Scotland. So that's the background. And to this, up to this point, you need to take out from the what's in the paper the things that are simply not right. But what you and what you're left with is still, nevertheless, what was being said from the start. Double entry stems from the way that business operated. The, it was in response to the shortage of cash and the structure of the records was defined by the legal system in place. As, as it changed, so did the records. The body of knowledge in modern accounting has never been fully under control of accounts of professional associations because since legislation began to be applied to it, its legislation has been at least very least influenced by non-accounts. 
So take the IASB. They're, they pride themselves on being open to consultation from anyone who wants to listen. So when it's busy deliberating the next accounting standard, of course, some people with a vested interest who are not accountants are going to make recommendations. In some cases, those recommendations will end up being part of the standard. So there is an element whereby it's not under control of accountants. And he says in the paper that they've, as a result of this fixation we're getting, the numbers in the financial statements to be understandable and usable. There's this for fixation on getting the regulations right instead of thinking about other things accounting can be used for. Now you can see the issues or the problems that relate to that point. When you look at how ineffective any attempt to have uh, social environmental reporting as part of the annual report, how long it took for that to, to make a real appearance, how low was the level of support for the idea of having an integrated report in most places in the world where professional accountants are working. South Africa being the only jurisdiction that's actually enforced it for, a very, for several years now as a mandatory report because that in itself is a way of providing information that gives other things than just the the uh, money that's in the financial statements it is more useful to the users because it's richer information and he, he he's really saying we've got to stop focusing on getting the dotting the i's and crossing the t's and making sure that all the numbers are as perfect as possible and i think more about make, providing a service that no one else can provide looking for the opportunities for accountants to step in and do things so there was a growth of a, a professional group that has been going on, or there was, but it was it was very prominent about 10 years ago, and it's still going on, and that's the pr forensic accountants. Forensic accountants do things like going and looking at an, a company's uh, information system and analysing whether it's doing what it's meant to be doing, or alternatively, analysing to find out what it is doing. So, for example, if you suspect a senior manager in a business of fraud or engaging in fraudulent transactions, you send in the forensic accounting team and they will take apart the information system to try and identify what's going on. Now, they are working with accountants. They are employed by accounting firms, the professional accounting firms, but they are not professional accountants. They are computer specialists, uh, management specialists, psychologists, whatever. And the minority of them are accountants. And accounting practice had the opportunity 15 years or so ago, maybe longer, to grab that professional group and make it part of the accounting profession. It would not have been difficult. It would have just have required that they, the professionally qualified accountants were given the opportunity when they qualified to go and do a separate qualification in forensic accounting. And the, uh, the, that already exists and has existed for a considerable number of years for taxation. So they could have done that, but they chose not to. And as a result, that was an opportunity lost while the accounting profession was busy worrying about the latest regulations. So that's the point. It's the sort of things that Lee's got in the back of his mind, although he doesn't mention that particular one. In his conclusion, he, he makes a few points, like this one about who actually is controlling what's happening in modern accounting. Have we actually lost control of it because the bodies that are, are governing accounting, the FASB and the ISB, aren't um, staffed entirely or influenced entirely by accountants. And he says that the research that could be done that would result in a more informed view on this by the profession, which might result in the changes needed in order to preserve the future of the profession, is not being done because academic accountants have been forced to publish those things that, that are not about how to do or be an accountant and what it needs to happen to improve it. So the research is looking in the wrong place. It's finally, he says that 
these findings signal an urgent need for accountants and their professional associates to commit totally and ambiguously to search for an authority body of accounting knowledge. Knowledge that has cognitive authority and potentially produce accounting numbers functionally fit for use. In other words, accountants need to take total and unwavering responsibility to the body of accounting knowledge and to apply it far better than they're doing so far so that they ring fence the profession and make it fit for purpose in a way that it has never been.